Payat. Rich Roll. Srimati. It's me. Welcome to the podcast. I'm back. It's been a long time. I think this is the longest that we've gone. I know. Since what I ha- started the show what since happened? you've been on. What's been going on with you? I don't know. What's I just, behind I that? I just got caught up in all the fancy people That's that I get right. to have on. You forgot who was living <laughs> you in, your, in your life. Hey, you're quietly in the background waving your hand. Hi, I'm still here. That's okay. I appreciate it. I think I was on in August last was it August? Yeah, it's been almost a full year. So I don't know when this is going to air, but we're in mid-July right now. Yeah. Um, in the wake of celebrating, celebrating with quotation marks around it, our, our 16th anniversary. <laughs> well, sh- we can't anniversary. wait to share our anniversary celebration <laughs> with all of you. Yeah. Uh, how are you feeling about the state of our marriage? I'm feeling very good about the state of oh, our marriage, Oh, that's good to hear. Actually. Even though it's I haven't on, been on, on a year. It's on and the record. Even, even though that there was no really anniversary celebration, I even know. in spite of those things. And I feel really good about our marriage, actually. I had done four podcast interviews, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday was our anniversary, and I was so toasted. There was no Shakti for Srimati. <laughs> was nothing. He gave it all I to gave you it guys. To every, I gave it to other people, That's and I had right. nothing left for you. I'm the worst when it comes to holidays. You're not really. I ha- well, I have a resistance to um, <laughs> dates on the calendar that, you know, we're, we're sort of socially contracted to celebrate. Like, there's res- something inside of me that rebels against that and doesn't want to, um, you know, basically play the game. Are you saying that you're resentful that it was our anniversary? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm more resentful that uh, somebody else decides when we're supposed to celebrate things. Yeah, you're right. Right? It's horrible. <laughs> well, we could celebrate right now. Okay, So let's do there it. was no diamond ring or anything like that. I still don't have a diamond ring. We don't even, <laughs> yeah, wear, yeah, we don't even wear wedding rings, actually. So. Well, I'm glad that you're feeling good about our marriage. I am. I feel like we're, um, well, a couple things. I mean, first, we're sort of entering into a new phase of our relationship as two people that have been together for a very long time, and uh, which is really cool and interesting and, um, I don't know, exciting, I guess. That's the first thing. The second thing I forgot. Okay. Well, that's good. It's good you came prepared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the typical thing happened before we sat down yesterday. I'm like, okay, I want you to put some thought into what we're going to talk about today. And you just shrugged me off. <laughs> so the onus is on you. Well, we've established that I function better in the moment. All and right. that's so when I can truly be a service. Here's the moment. The moment, so is, right the now, moment is right so, now. So, so, so dance. So dance. But you have to tell me what, where you want to go. No, this is your a, show. This is, it's on you. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> This is the, this is what you wanted. This is what you asked for. A so you spontaneous. Were saying, you were saying that you were happy about the state of our marriage, and you said it was good because we are at a new moment. And then mm-hmm. you said there was a second thing. Yeah, I just remember what okay, the second good. thing is. So I'm leading you. Um, as two people that have been together for twenty year, twenty one years at this point, right? I, I'm not. I sure. mean, we, we started. We we got together in 1999. Yeah, because we spent the millennium together. Right, that I remember. I rem- that. That I remember. <laughs> you broke your wrist. <laughs> yes, I remember snowboarding. Um, I feel like we've earned the right to not be relationship experts. I can't. I, I I'm averse to that term, but we have experience. That, we do, uh, and and a little bit of wisdom. We do that we can share. We have true so life. Experience. This is your diving board, and you're launching off. Yeah, point. well, I do actually consider myself an ex- expert in relationship, and that's because um, you are my third foray into the marriage. Right. You structure always like to bring system. that up. I like to just be. I don't up like front it when it. you bring. That up. You don't. <laughs> no. Why? Let's focus on us. Okay. Let's. But focus all right, on us. you can contextualize. No, so it, it makes that way. it does make me a relationship expert because I have that history. So I have uh-huh. these. I had you know a very hellish abusive marriage. I had a very romantic fairy tale marriage. And now I have the marriage you and yeah, I, I have I, together. I got to burst the fairy tale. You did, kind of. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, I don't that's, know I, how I feel about that. You should feel good about it because it's a really, it's a really real thing and it's an, it's an amazing thing when you can break through that. Not that we don't love romance or not that we don't in, enjoy those kind of interactions, but I think when you are truly meeting in all aspects of the relationship, when you're 
you're taking responsibility to create your own fulfillment within your own self, there really is no prince, princess, fairy tale paradigm. And in fact, when you play in that paradigm, it's actually, um, it's actually a dishonoring, a dishonoring of the divine being, because as life forms, each of us have enough energy within ourselves to fulfill our divine mission or our blueprint or our soul mission or the reason that we're in this life. Right. So in other words, if you're overly invested in another human being to take care of certain things for you, uh, then you're basically hamstringing or handicapping yourself because that power and resilience and energy and self-sufficiency lives within you. Yeah, definitely. And if you feel like it is your uh, job or your uh, mission to fix another person or fulfill that in another person, and that gives you a sense of pride or, uh, or like importance, you're in fact hindering that individual from truly becoming themselves. Uh huh. So how am I doing in that regard? You're doing great. And you always have from the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. And I've shared before- I let before, you be you. Well, you let me be me. And you also, I think because of your recovery, and I really credit the fact that you are in a 12-step program and that you have the recovery tools you know, in your experience, coupled with my spiritual perspective, we have a pretty powerful toolbox to you know, take out and dive into when we get into trouble or when uh-huh. we step into something that very that is very, very intense. And when I first met you, one of the most amazing things you ever said to me was, um, I see you're in pain and I feel for you. I'm compassionate towards you, but I have nothing to do with that pain and I don't know how to help you. Like, I don't have the answers. And you were one of the first male um, relationships in my life that said to me, I don't have the answers for you. And that was like a breath of fresh air to me because uh, when you have somebody who who claims they always have the answers for you or they know better or they're trying to sort of guide or rule your life or uh, assess your life or analyze your life, inherent in those actions is a distrust and a non-belief in you, in me. And it feels like an oppression or like a like a suppression or a a pressing down, a keeping down of the energy of what wanted to come through me as a woman, as you know, as my own life form, as my own divine life form that has all the energy she needs to fulfill herself mm-hmm. within herself. Well, the conventional male female relationship paradigm is one in which the man comes into a conflict or a predicament with this overwhelming impulse to just fix it and make it right or say, this is what you need to do. Like, let's resolve this. And the conventional female perspective is, I don't want to, I don't want you to fix it. I don't need you to fix it. I just want to be heard and acknowledged. Is that yeah? It could it could be? I mean, I think it. You know, I think some women do want men to fix it, and I I think they're still living in that paradigm. And you know, that was a big cornerstone of of how we went through nine years financial collapse and transforming into living our dreams, and the fact that I wasn't yelling at you to go get a job, or I wasn't putting the onus on you to fix all the financial issues, and so I. I felt at that time like I believe in living what is in the heart, in finding what is in the heart and serving the heart. The heart is the divine mind, not the brain. Mm. So if I wanted that for myself, which I do, and I want that for my children, I had to want that for my husband, even though times were hard. I couldn't say, well, I'm finding my divine voice and you go clock in at the law firm and make everything fine. Right. So somehow I knew because I had this extreme faith, I had this knowing and this awareness that the way through these challenges was to really find out what was the truth of each of our hearts and to do everything that we could to fulfill that. And that some way, by some grace, by some miracle or some divine intervention, that somehow our lives would be ordered in a way that it would support that expression. Was there ever a moment where you thought it was too much and you were like, 
this is not working and I'm ready to give up. There was one moment and it was when we had almost come through, we were coming through and it was when you DNF'd at Ultraman and you relapsed. Mm -hmm. And in the wake of that, after having held space for you for so many years, I mean, through such adversity and such friction and tension, it was hard for me to imagine that you would make that choice because I'm not an addict and I wasn't in that frame. But at that moment, I, I had a moment where I was like, have I misjudged who Rich is? Have I misjudged him because we're just arriving out of this battle and we're actually being realized and this is the choice he made in that moment? Yeah, that was a, a, a low moment. That was a rough, that was a rough experience to, to navigate through. I mean, the level of like shame and sense of disappointment that I had that I'd let myself down and you down and this whole plan down was very difficult. But in retrospect now, having, you know, many years passed since then, like, how do you look back on that experience? Um. It was, you know, it was still a hard moment. I yeah. mean, it was a it was a moment of, you know, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Quite frankly, you know. Um, it was uh, you know, super difficult. I mean, again, I've said it before, I was grateful for your uh, community in AA and all the guys that you have around you. So many beautiful men that are in your life as a part of that program. And you know, they were right there. And you know, Tyler was there and you know, you got you know, you got righted like right away. Like it wasn't a, it wasn't a long, it wasn't a long uh, spell in that. Mm -hmm. But I do remember arriving back from Hawaii and I had supported you in your expression through all of these years. And I was, I gave birth to Jaya and was really sort of in this seclusion at home with the kids and doing ceremony and, and spiritual practices and ritual and holding this vision for us, and then started creating the food and the recipes. And I had um, written two albums and, and become musician along with Tyler and Trapper, our oldest sons. And so I was finally at the moment where I was going to get to record my album. And it had been years, it was seven years of, of working, workshopping these songs. And so right after that moment, when we arrived back home, that was my turn. That mm -hmm. was when Brad was coming here with his recording gear. We were setting up a studio in the house. I had him booked for 10 days to two weeks, and we were recording my first album. So part of me, what I did is I took my anger and put it to the side because I wasn't going to let that ruin my experience of music so I sort of just was like, okay, I don't like this, and this has really upset me, and Rich is fine now, and he's working it out, and so I'm going to put this to the side for the moment, and I'm going to focus on this creative expression. And then what happened is the boy's dad died suddenly and tragically right. on day three of my recording session. So what I endured at the end of that year, 2011, was pretty staggering. I mean, a pretty, pretty intense um, sort of energetic experience that I had to traverse through after having held that vision for us for so long. And even though I hadn't been with the boy's dad for 14 years, he was very close in their lives and very close to me. And I had to process that grief through myself. So it was still many, many months and many, many things before my music came to fruition. And by that time, I guess we had just worked it all out, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But I suspect it made you a stronger person to have to endure all of that and navigate the difficulties of, uh, the complex difficulties of loss, anger, creative output, parenting and just the general responsibilities of having to, you know, get through the day. I mean, even though, yes, we were emerging from our financial difficulties, we were by no means out of the woods at that point. I mean, there was still quite a ways to go and we would dip deeper before we kind of really emerged out of it. It's true. It's true. I mean, what I would say from my perspective of that, I would say that it was a full experience of life that I, that I experienced. And that experience was full of heartbreak, 
loss, uh, tragedy, triumph, creative connection. And the weirdest thing was during the days following the death of the boy's father, Lou, um, I felt a simultaneous experience of grief and birth. And it's not something that I've ever spoken about before. I probably never told you about this before. But it was a very profound dichotomy of this juxtaposition of two extremes that are maybe the same thing. And so it was an extremely profound, potent, a really deep experience. His exit from this world was one of the most profound experiences that I've had. And it's because there were all these synchronicities and signs that were in the music, uh, in people that I met, um, just coincidences and, and, and things that happened during that time. And I really did feel the presence of divinity in that space. I felt that it was it was meant, I remember when you were racing and Ultraman Lou was texting me and he was checking you, he was following the race. And that was kind of a first mm-hmm. because it's not like we were just, you know, we were really good getting divorced and really took care of the children, but it's not like we were hanging out all the time. No, I mean, Lou wasn't. Lou was great, but he wasn't like my buddy. No, we weren't friends, yeah. but he was, you know, kind and respectful. And we, you know, we, we all handled it like grownups, you know, but it's not like we were taking vacations together or right. something like that. So he was following your race in those last days. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was texting me and really excited and, and all of that. And so um, I think that, uh, that it was just... I forgot my train of thought, what I was just saying. But anyway, it was a... It the was a, divinity in the experience. Yeah, it was very, very divine. I mean, there were other things that happened, like um, uh, uh, Lou's first cousin, Mina. Uh, I was very close with her when I was married to him. And I hadn't talked to her in like... We hadn't been together for 14 years. I hadn't talked to her for 14 years. So when he passed, we were in contact. And she couldn't attend the memorial service that I facilitated, that I officiated here in our home. You know, I told the boys, now it's a healing project. That's basically what it is. It's a healing mission. And we had everyone come in, you know, from his life, past business um, associates, past lovers, wives, girlfriends, you know, everyone was here. (laughs) All of his lovely cousins, the Pyatt family, you know, an amazing group of individuals. And I officiated that, that process for all of us. And it was really, really beautiful. Uh, Mina couldn't come because she had been given, uh, she had bought a trip for her girlfriend and they were going to Kauai Mm -hmm. and everything had already been booked and bought and everything else. So uh, at that time, Saul Ray, who's a, you know, well-known, renowned yoga teacher that, you know, I grew up in yoga with, and he's been a great ally and a great friend to me and to us. Um, He, you know, emailed or texted me and he was like, Srimati, like, could you come and cook for my retreat? And he said, he knows that I have a special connection to Secret Beach on Kauai. He said, it's near Secret Beach. I don't know if I'm asking too much, but I think it would be good and I could pay you. We needed money. Mm -hmm. So I asked the boys and they said, go ahead and go, mom. So I went there and I remember cooking completely in grief. And Saul would say, what's on the menu? And I would say, I have no idea, but something will be there. And I literally couldn't even make a menu list because I was in such grief. So Mina contacts me. She's on Kauai at the same time. I haven't seen her in 14 years. And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm on the island. Meet me at the Hindu temple at morning puja. So I'm sitting in the temple And she slides up right next to me and we sit together for puja. And we took those flowers from the offering from the priest that day. And we went down to Secret Beach and we walked and we reminisced about Lou and we offered these flowers into the ocean. So there were many, many profound things that happened during this time. Also connected to my music, Um, Tyler and I were recording in the Sun, which is a song that I wrote about you, and I wrote about the pressure of life and the financial constriction and how hard it is in this world, you know, especially for men to to earn enough and, and be enough and succeed. And the chorus of this song was, fly, daddy, fly, fly, daddy, fly. 
And I had written that chorus on a previous return from the island of Kauai from doing spiritual practice. And I had asked for the chorus, and that's what was given. Mm. So years later, uh, after the boys and I workshopped this song over seven years in many different forms, um, Tyler and I even had sung it on the big island during that trip. When you DNF'd, we walked up to the local um, music store and we played it and sang it in the store. And when we finished, we looked up and the shop owner had broken down sobbing in tears. And she said, I'm so sorry. Like you just, it touched me. It touched me. We walked out and Tyler looked at me and he was like, okay, that was good. Like as a musician, if you can make somebody cry with your song, like Mm -hmm. that's a good sign. So here we were, the boys had said, you know, mom, we know you wrote that song about Rich, but we also think it's about Lou. And it is, it's about every man. And so we would find out later that um, when Lou called 911, he had a heart attack on a kayak. When he called 911, Tyler and I were actually recording that exact song. Mm. So the actual recording on the album Mother of Mine is the exact track at the moment that Lou left his body, that he left this world and moved to another realm. And what was shown to me during that time, when I met Lou, I was in an abusive marriage and I was a battered woman. I was on the out of it. I was coming out of it, but that's the truth. That's the ugly truth. And Lou rescued me. He truly was a rescuer. That was his archetype. And that, and he was a fix-it man. He mm-hmm. was like, I'm going to fix your life for you. you know. And he really did. My creative trajectory when I was married to him was like a rocket. I mean, I became an artist, a fashion designer, started my own collection. This was all from being in a relationship where I couldn't even take a step without second-guessing myself. And uh, what I was shown through this experience, what I felt is that Lou had rescued me in this world and I had rescued him into the other world because I knew the spiritual essence and the practices and the rituals and the awareness to actually get him out of his body and get him into the other realm. And the boys were sequestered here safely at our sacred home at Jai House we were recording music. Like it was, it just felt like it was all sort of divinely planned. And, um, you know, I haven't spoken about it very much because it's a very, very private and very dear thing, but um, it was a profound experience. Mm-hmm. That's beautifully put. I remember I was out running on the trails when my phone rang. Mm-hmm. You said, you have to come home right now. And you mm-hmm. told me what what had happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the... I'm going to try to say it without without crying, but um, to let's see, it was a horrifying experience to wake your children up to tell them that story, you know. And I remember we had a Ganesh, and I told Mathis ahead of time, and Mathis was much younger, yeah, like was she five, was six. five or six, right? Something just, like that. Just turned six, I think. Yeah. So she was like, mom, why are you crying? Why are you crying? And I, and I told her, I said, I have to wake the boys up and I have to tell them that their dad is gone. And I remember I woke them up and we, we gathered around the Ganesh and I wrapped them in the ponchos that we got on our retreats in Mexico. And, you know, I told them and, and hours afterwards, I went upstairs to take a bath. And I remember Mathis coming in, little baby. And she said to me, Mama, she said, you did the very best you could. You did such a good job. You did the very best that you could. And that was just a, you know, a beautiful, a beautiful moment of this experience with our children and how, how amazing they are and how how powerful they are and how wise they are and what they offer us, you know, in Mm -hmm. those moments. So it was deep. Yeah, I mean, I remember that moment pretty vividly and I couldn't help but think this is that moment where innocence is now lost. Yeah, yeah. And the harsh reality of the world, you know, dawns upon them. Yeah, 
So and they were, how, how old were they? I think they were time? 14 like, and yeah, 15, 15 yeah. something like that. Yeah. And the other thing is, is, you know, anybody that's met Tyler and Trapper, they're, they have all the best aspects of their dad. I mean, they're extraordinary individuals. And as young men, who they are, I mean, any child, but we just really felt like they didn't deserve this. Like this wasn't, you know, this wasn't a fate that seemed uh, akin to them. And I mean, you say well, that. And because- it also, it also came on the heels of all the hardship that, you know, they <laughs> yeah. had to endure because of the yeah. struggles that we were having. Yeah. And it, so it was like a sucker punch, yeah. you know, at a, at a vulnerable, at yeah. a moment that was already very raw and vulnerable. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's true. And what I want to share and what I did learn from this experience, and I think it, it might be useful to others, is, is uh, when we have children with people and we, um, those contracts come to completion, because being somebody that's married, been married three times, I do believe, I don't believe there's one soulmate for us. I believe there's many. And it's a lot about divine timing. And it's a lot about these contracts that we have that we enter into relationships with people, and then they come to completion and they're complete. So it's not that it was a failure. It's that the experience, the work or the exchange or the alchemy is now complete. And sometimes that includes having children. And so we have, you know, divorced families or mixed households. But what I do want to remind everybody and something that I learned is that when you have children with somebody, you share an energetic structure that it was, it's within your being. And even though I hadn't been with Lou for 14 years, I didn't want to be with Lou. I was happily married to you. And we have new kids, you know, other kids. And, and it was, it was, I was never longing to be back there. It was complete. Right. But when he passed, the boy's grief passed through me as their mother. And so what I realized in that was like, oh, Like, you can't separate that energetic. And we understood spiritually that he was no longer here. I knew it immediately. Um, We weren't weren't angry at life. We weren't trying to, you know, reconcile or or change fate or whatever. We, We well understood. We had deep spiritual tools. You know, I've had sessions where I've interacted with him with other guides. So, I have a, an expanded experience of Lou and where he is. Um, but what I would say is that um, you cannot bypass the grief that must pass through your body because we are physical and we are in a physical container, a physical life form. And the one thing that I would offer to parents that have these contracts that have come to completion, this is another reason why it's so important to maintain a level of respect and dignity around those that you have co-created with, because those individuals share aspects of that other person. And so if you're speaking badly or choosing to view your partner in a lower vibration, you are including the children in that unawareness, in Mm -hmm. that misstep in that imbalanced choice. So the more that you can see the good, you can hold the good, the higher vision, and speak that, you know, about your partner that you are no longer with, this in fact fortifies the children and Mm. helps the children to be whole. Yeah, I think that's super important, Um, but also very difficult to put into practice in my experience of watching other people navigate the vicissitudes of breaking up. Like we've been together for long enough to be privy to lots of relationships over the years that, that haven't made it. Like I feel very grateful that we're in this place and we feel connected and, you know, our intimacy is um, in check and we continue to grow and support each other emotionally and all of these good things. Like I don't take that for granted at all because I think it's, it's rare and perhaps even increasingly more and more rare. Um, but I have you know, noticed uh, watching friends and colleagues and other people uh, figure out how to move forward after a breakup that oftentimes the partners will intend to maintain that level of integrity. Like we're, gonna, we're not going to – go the divorce route of going to court and all of that. We're going to keep this super cool and 
we're friends and you know, the, 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 with the best of intentions. Right. But then something happens along the way and cracks in that firmament begin to appear. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, that there's a de-evolution that takes place where suddenly there is a bunch of smack talking mm -hmm. in front of the kids and, you know, it really takes a turn for the worse. Mm -hmm. um, and it's heartbreaking to see that. Um, I'm empathetic because m most of these people that I know that have gone through this are really good people mm -hmm. and, and they do have the best of intentions, but something takes place that kind of kicks it into a different um, climate where their lower instincts kind of take control. It's true. And I, I have a little bit to offer on that from experience. And I would say that um, consciously, um, they say consciously uncoupling. Yeah, un uncoupling. Now. Uncoupling. uncoupling. Right. now, but consciously, um, you know, making, making an intention to, to separate, you know, in grace is, is no easy path. It is a warrior's path. It takes fierce commitment and you have to eat your ego so much. So let me be clear, when Lou and I divorced, um, you know, I, I will say both of us, I mean, you know, I want to say he did a lot of stuff I didn't like. I'm sure I did a lot of stuff he didn't like. So what I'd say, what I'd say is both partners will do things that are not in alignment. We are not perfect people. Okay. Someone will make a stupid move and do a stupid thing and, you know, bring a relationship in and, you know, in front of the kids or, you know, whatever, do, do something that's really, you know, that's really wrong. That's really not right. Right. In all of those situations, a really great practice is to separate the action from the soul. So it's the same thing with, any, with anyone you love. As you can say to yourself, I do not like what he did or what she did, but I love her. I love him. I love them at a soul level. So I'm going to separate that deep, deep, you know, connection to the truth of who they are. And I'm still going to hold that highest vision for them. Even if they've done the dumbest thing that is so, you know, vile or so attacking or whatever it is, if you can be powerful enough to hold that neutral and to hold that vision and say, okay, I'm going to allow my personality to be upset about the actions of the individual but I'm going to hold the highest divinity and I'm going to remember we created these children in love. And there were times where we were so divine and things were so amazing. And this is a good person. And let me remind myself of all the good qualities of this person. So you have to understand this person is suffering. This person is going through a, a change of everything they know. They're grasping for some kind of stability. Whether you're the lever or the levy, it's never easy. It's not fun to get divorced. And it doesn't matter how much you wanted it, you will still process the pain and the loss. Yeah. So if you can just keep that in your awareness, you will do much better. And if you can find every opportunity to speak highly of the person that you created these children with, there has to be some attribute about something of the person that is a, a beautiful quality, or you wouldn't have had children with them to yeah. begin with. So there has to be something. And so that's a, that's a very, very powerful tool that you can, you can choose to practice. It is a choice of perspective. Mm -hmm. And society will want to drag you into name-calling, Society will want you to um, uh, meet their pain in the destruction and the failure of divorce. But you can make a different choice. You can choose a perspective. Yes, you know, people would say, oh, I'm so sorry it didn't work out. And I would say, oh, no, it worked out beautifully. It was a magnificent experience. We spent 10 years together. We had amazing children. We created amazing creative projects. That experience came to completion. And even about my abusive relationship, oh, it was a divine experience, literally transformed me, taught me so much. He is my divine teacher. Mm. How did you feel about that in the moment? Though? Horrible. Yeah. No. Right. Well, I mean, it's, I'm, just, I'm just trying to place myself in the position of somebody who's sitting in that mm -hmm. angst at the moment. 
And to say to that person, when the other partner is doing something that you don't agree with or, you know, behave, misbehaving, mm -hmm. to say, take the higher ground, you know, shine that person with love. I mean, that is the path forward. Ultimately, you're playing the long game. Mm -hmm. It may not solve the specific issue in the moment, but truly it is the only way to move forward and free yourself from the triggers of, you know, fear and anger and resentment and whatever else is boiling up. Yeah, it's it's really, really hard. And I mean, I would use that's why the it's abusive relationship that I was in that I was in has been such a magnificent teacher. I mean, first of all, let me just say that I was kind of a I was kind of arrogant. I was a little bit flippant. I was toying with, you know, male attention, you know, I was I was a young girl, you know, and in my early 20s. And you know what that relationship taught me? It taught me to really cherish people who are kind. That's what it taught me. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, when, you, when you've been on the receiving end of something very, very ugly for a long time that is, you know, potentially ruining your life, you come to very, very much respect people who are kind. And I think in the beginning, you know, being in my late teens and early 20s, I was, you know, a little bit flippant and thought I knew everything and all that, you know, we go through. And, you know, the other thing is um, what I learned in that experience is that every solution is resolved within your own being. All the power for your experience is within your own being. It's not about the other person. Yeah. So it's not what the other person is doing. It's who are you in the face of what is going on? Yeah. And what are you, who are you big enough to hold that vibration and to stop partaking in this exchange? And, you know, I had a therapist say to me during the time, you know, that fighting is fucking. It's the same thing. So right. if you're fighting a lot with who you're in relationship with, it's just another form of the engagement. Right. So are you really done or are you just in there still duking it out? So when are you going to stop that cycle? And, and also we have to understand that our partners are not ourselves. So like in my case, Lou was very, very upset that I wasn't giving the boys meat. You know, he was like, you know, I'm concerned for their well-being. And he was trying to, you know, push meat on them when they were there. And they were pretty bonded to me and didn't really eat meat very much. So I was fine because I had, I'm, you know, I think as the mother at that age, I just had a lot of influence over them. But I didn't spend time being angry at him or, or ch make that a reason why we should fight. Because then the kids were in an experience of fighting. And the most important thing was for them to feel a peace and a community and a respect and a dignity between their parents. And so I, I would choose that over, you know, whose turn is it to have the kids or not? Mm -hmm. And in our case, we both adored our kids and wanted them with us all the time, as I believe most parents do. Um, and we never let them stay with a third person. We took them every time. If Lou had a business trip, he'd just say, I'm leaving. I'd say, great, I'll take them. You know, or mm -hmm. if I had to go, he said, honey, you know, honey, bring them, I'll take them. So there is a way to do this in a positive way and get our own, deal with our own trauma and hurts and fears and losses within ourselves and try to keep the environment pretty clean for the kids, you know? Yeah, I think that that in a lot of these cases, I, w I would say, I would contend almost invariably, each parent is going to have their own unique parenting style, and they're going to have different priorities uh, and, and ways in which they want to raise their kids. And when you split up and the kids are vacillating between two households, those differences are going to get exacerbated because there isn't necessarily a meeting of the minds about you know how much you know, time on the devices is there going to be how, you know, how much time to homework and what is the, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I think when one parent gets involved in trying to control or change the way the other parent is attempting to parent those children, mm -hmm. that's where a lot of conflict arises. Um, and I've seen this happen. So, um, I think recognizing that you have to release control over that and allow that other person to parent the way that they want and that you get to have domain over that when the kids are in your house is really the only healthy choice that you can make. I think it is. I mean, I think it's the most peaceful, aware choice you can make. And, you know, from my standpoint, I believe that we all choose our parents to create a certain 
field to that will that will seed and grow a certain experience that is for our own evolution. So every being has chosen the parental form that they're incarnating into. So no matter what that parent is doing, that is part of their evolution. And right. so by you getting involved in trying to change it or shift it or judge it or make it wrong, you're in fact taking some of their experience from them, even if that's difficult experience. Mm -hmm. I like this idea of reframing societal and social expectations around relationships to remove the, the shame associated with a split by just mm. relabeling it as completed. And nice? I think it gives people freedom because when somebody's relationship goes off the rails or whether they're married or not, there's so much emotional energy invested in it, A, but then there's all these external pressures that get layered on top of that that make people feel bad mm -hmm. if they make the decision to like move away from it, mm -hmm. right? There's, mm -hmm. there's this sense of failure. And I think when you start to think of it as a cycle that has completed, that's now allowed you to move on and, and you know, um, embrace a different kind of relationship mm -hmm. is a much healthier way to look at it. And I think it's applicable not just in romantic relationships, but in, in our professional lives or with mentors, like a mentor can come in and serve a certain role for an individual to catalyze growth to a certain point. And then that growth curve is, you know, peaks out and is completed and it's time for somebody else to enter your life and serve a role. And likewise, or conversely, we all do that in similar ways for other people. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, what is what is the triumph of staying married to somebody that you're complete with? You made it. You did it. <laughs> you made it to the end, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's just... Holding on. Right. You know, That's like a... It. Like a yeah. I can't stand her, but... <laughs> like a dry drunk trying not to yeah. drink. Yeah, it's just... I, it, it is a societal... And, you know, listen, I mean, I'm a very monogamous person, you know, I and I think you are too. So mm -hmm. we don't really have that, you know, polyamorous situation in our makeup. So... We are very committed. We find freedom and commitment. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the life is about the journey in the same way, even in this, you know, abusive experience that I found myself in, in the early days, you know, I was really pissed. Like I had a hard time even imagining that I would take responsibility for any of this because none of this was sourcing from me. And what he would try to brainwash me into believing was that I made him hit me. So that was, that was basically the the abusive cycle. And it was a classic cycle. Mm. So it took me a long time, but I realized later down the road, just, you know, maybe a couple years down after I'd licked my wounds for a long time, um, I, uh, I realized that, that until I uh, took my own responsibility for being in the relationship and allowing him to treat me that way, that I would still be in bondage to this nightmare that had been a, such a big teacher in my life. Mm -hmm. And so by owning the fact that I'm a creator and understanding that that was a karmic experience that I had to experience in order to burn it, or that it was for my evolution. And I experienced a lot of ev evolution in that relationship. And I think that evolution is what allows me to have the type of relationship that I have with you today. Mm -hmm. So it's in the freedom of taking responsibility that we free ourselves. And once again, we go back to uh, what I'm seeking for you at this moment, at this precipice, which it's good that we have the cameras on and the, the mics on because we haven't really <laughs> talked you, about this. Yeah, what are you going to say? Well, I'm I'm really ready for the next evolution of what this relationship is. And I mean, for for better or worse, worse or like it or not, I mean, you and I are very different individuals. Yeah. We are maybe extremely different. And somehow we have been put together by Divine Mother for this journey that has ignited some inspiration, some vision for, you know, for many who, you know, write to us, who, who want to know how we are in relationship. And the fact that we are so extreme that, you know, sort of everything about the way we walk the earth is c completely different. The way we approach the earth, the way we experience life. 
And I'm looking for now this next level of evolution and expansion when we are truly igniting both feminine and masculine energies within ourselves. And as we access these greater energies of fully stepping into our power, how does that look in a new paradigm relationship? And so we have traces and aspects of this prince princess paradigm that we, you know, we've, that we've played into that have worked for us. And it is a, a human way of relating man and wife. And I feel like we are on the precipice of writing a new way of being relate in relationship. And, and what does that mean? And so for me to be clear, cause I can see you're like, you're like, can you make a list? Can you no, be I'm not, specific? I, 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 but I do want, yeah, flesh that out flesh for that me. Out. So I know exactly what you're talking I mean, talking I'm about. looking for, first of all, more ceremony in our marriage. I'm look, but I'm I'm looking for it not in not in that I'm doing it and you're going along with it. I'm looking for a recognition and a knowing of the power of ritual and ceremony. And as we move through life, the letting go of our habits of watching Netflix, of watching, you know, movies, whatever those humanly activities are that that gather our attention for a moment. I'm looking for an expansion into really understanding that a life is precious and every moment we spend is precious. And now that we know that we've been given the privilege of being in this space, of having an audience, of having people that we can commune with, really committing to using that time and using that time in relationship. So We're back to the anniversary, no date, no celebration. The reason why I wasn't really attached to it is I didn't want to go to dinner with you. I don't want to go to a movie with you. I don't want to go do some typical anniversary-esque, you know, I don't want a dozen rosins from you. I want to go on the side of a cliff and like take our clothes off and you know, write a, you know, light a ceremonial fire. Not really, because there are fires around here. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, I want to explore what can we really do together that's beyond... I've, I've gone to enough dinners. I've had enough roses. I don't need to go to another dinner. I don't need to go to... We can't even go to a hotel room because you sleep in a tent. <laughs> yeah. So unless we bring the tent well, to the hotel room. I, no, I get what you're saying. So do you... Can yeah, you, and, I, and I'm, I'm up for that. You know, I'm up for that new experience uh and i think it would it it would cultivate a uh a, an enhanced level of intimacy that would take us into this next chapter and i i think just doing a retrospective on on you know where we're at and how we got here i look at it like this we we got together for whatever reason to co-create um we committed to this path less trodden. We underwent difficulties. We burned in the fire. Almost died. (laughs) To to emerge from that. And then we're presented with opportunities that I think over the last um, seven years, whatever it is, eight years, I have just worked my ass off to capitalize on in order to create stability for the family and also, almost as an amends for the trauma that preceded it, and to prove to myself that I could be a successful, productive member of society, which is something I had previously struggled with my entire life, um, or at least beginning when I started started drinking. And I've been in kind of crisis mode for that entire eight-year period, Um just trying to make it work. And now we've emerged from that with a situation that is successful. It's stable. I've got this platform. Um, I'm able to provide for the family. And essentially I'm in this incredibly privileged, rare situation where I get to make choices about where I want to place my energy and make money. Like I am essentially in control of that. But I'm still operating day to day like I'm in that triage situation. And this has been impressed upon me by many people 
to just listen, you you can take a minute here and breathe and relax. And I'm like, yeah, but I got to do this. And then this is happening. And it's like, yeah, five years ago, you had to be that way. Maybe two years ago, you had to be that way. But now you don't have to be that way. And what is it all worth if you can't really feel gratitude moment to moment for what you have co-created and to be present in your own life. And that's something that I definitely struggle with moment to moment um, and something that I want to be able to embrace and bring into my life in a more meaningful way. And it's, that's a challenge for me, mm-hmm. you know, cause I'm running, I'm running this program and the fear associated with flipping the switch and doing it a different way gets associated in my mind with um, stopping, you know, like an arresting of the things that got me here, right? Like this is the way I do it and this is what's working. To do it any way differently would mean um, risking capsizing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you that you have done an extraordinary job of coming into this level of expression. And it's absolutely beautiful to see, and it's breathtaking. And that has been an amazing experience for all of us, definitely. I would also say, again, that in a human format, we like to make a list and say from the brain that we have all these things to do first, and then we'll get to the spirituality And so what we have to remember and what I will remind you is it is the purity of this relationship that fruited this entire drama, the entire thing that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So it started on a very special day. Well, it started before, but the day that we actually were married, it was a spiritual world concert. There were channelers, Bhagavan Das, Kirtan, gospel singers, African wedding dancers, and it literally was all about spirituality. And it was one of the most beautiful days in my life. I posted it on our anniversary on my Instagram feed. Um, That ceremony is what was the intention that created what we experience now. Are you connected with that? Yeah. Okay. I am. So what I'm saying is that (laughs) I just wanted to check in because you never really asked. You were like, yeah, it was okay. No, uh, it, it is that level of of desire, of devotion. It's really this devotion, this, this, this love affair with life, the love affair with the wonder of life and what is pulsing through each one of us and all life. And so what I would say to you is that you don't have to change the format of how you run the podcast. I mean, sure you can shift and all that. And, you know, we're going to be taking some time off in December, which is magnificent. So all of that is great. But I guess what I'm talking to more is In the day-to-day of how you go about your day, I know there is time that is spent either, and this for all of us, I'm not like judging, I'm just saying it's social media, it's scrolling through Twitter, it's uh, Netflix, it's, it's stuff that we do out of habit, stuff that we do out of habit, and this would be good for everybody. What if we all made a list for the next week of things we do out of habit that are not high vibrational activities that are furthering the life, that are actually being medicated or being suppressed or controlled by the society to check out. What are we- That are serving as medication. Yeah, but we just do it by default because we don't really even, we're not really thinking of it. We're like, okay, I worked a hard day. Now I deserve an episode of Handmaid's Handmaid's Tale. Right, because I just want to distract myself and I just want to breathe and just, can I just not think about my life right now and invest in some story that'll- that'll lull me into a a, a sleep state. But what if you like chose, let's not ask you to give it all up, but let's just say if just one day a week, there was a two hour time period where you turned all the lights off and turned on a candle and you actually communed with the greater being that you are. And you were like, you know, like when I sit in that, it's like, uh, you know, lead me, guide me, direct me, reveal yourself to me, like reveal the path to me. I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm listening. 
So what I'm asking is, what would happen our, in our relationship if we used our beautiful intimacy, our divine sexual connection, our wonderful uh, pair, play of opposites? What if we actually seeped that consciously in devotion, not, from, not just from my side, because all these years I've been holding this, I've been doing this, the countless ceremonies, the countless you know, rituals that I've done for years and years and years and years. What I'm saying is that we have an opportunity to actually step into this in the next level. And it's a level of visioning. It's a level of taking responsibility. And it's a level of saying, okay, we're available. You've shown us the divinity of our, of our extremes together in relationship. And now we know that it's a new time on planet Earth and that we have an opportunity to move into a new kind of relationship. So lead us. So we're here. We're here and we're listening. It doesn't have to be like a big thing, but it could just be that. What if that was devoted to us instead of you going to group? instead, Or, or maybe in addition. But it seems like, again, it's like if this relationship, just like everything, if it's always the last thing because you think it's always going to be to get be here, then that's the danger Mm -hmm. or that's the misstep Mm -hmm. because it's not necessarily, Mm -hmm. it's not nothing that is un um, uncared for unacknowledged or, you know, not, not given the energy, then that thing doesn't grow. It doesn't change. It doesn't shift. And so as you and I are kind of veterans and we're entering, I cracked up the other day because I've had a couple moments, you know, I was reflecting before we went to Plant Power Italia, which I wanted to talk about a little bit. And on the way there, you know, I was thinking, wow, I wonder if this is going to be the last event that I do with Rich, because I know spiritually I'm moving into a different arena. You know, I'm also evolving beyond what I've experienced mm-hmm. in the past. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of prepared. I don't really know how this group is going to receive me. And then when we went through it, like they, like I was shown, they are exponentially like off the hook beyond right. anything we experienced. Well, and I should I should add that I went into it thinking this is probably the last time that we're going to do it as well, mm-hmm. um, and and that's informed in part by just how taxing the travel is, and it's in the same location. It's like the world's a big place. Why we keep going to the same farm? And it's amazing and beautiful and wonderful, and it works for what we do. But I was kind of like, am I over this? Like, are we done? Like, let's go through this week, and that'll probably be it. But go ahead. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's not your second nature. It's not something that you would no. do. It is my second nature. It's your nature. dharma to yeah. sit with people mm-hmm. and commune. It's it's not my thing. No, like I'm I'm you know, I can speak to hundreds of thousands of people, you know, through the microphone and I find my dharma more in that. Yes. Um, but the one-on-one kind of tutelage dynamic is not like I I can do it, but I have to really gear up for it and suit up whereas you can just pop into that and it gives you energy. And for me, it's draining. Yeah, it's true. And that's a difference. And luckily you've gone along because at the end of the week, what did, what did you say? So, yeah. So we have this experience with these, it was our biggest group, how many 52 people total, yeah, but, total. but I think eight of those were crew. staff, mm-hmm. um, big group of people. And it was just utterly transformative for everybody <laughs> who attended. And, in the aftermath of it, it was like, we have to do that. We have to, well, I guess we're coming back next year. Like we got to keep doing this, you know, it yeah. was just too, it was too moving and too impactful and, and too emotional to um, ignore that there, I think the point that you're, they're, you're driving towards is there's something about the uniting of our differing energies that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, catalyzes something powerful that neither of us can do on our own. And as we continue to evolve and evolve separately and develop our respective little worlds of what we do, that when we occasionally come together and that Venn diagram overlaps um, for you know a specific purpose, that there's something unique and cool and powerful about that that speaks to and is endemic in the energy that birthed this whole thing that we get to do in the first place. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's it's profound literally profound what happens 
And it's happened every single trip. It's just this was like exponential, like activated. I think it has to do with planetary conditions. And it also has to do with the fact that I went to Dom and her before. So I had this energy of the spiritual community that I had slept in the temples for three days. And so we were really primed for a really amazing experience. But it was a a delightful surprise. And this is a huge amount of work for us as well. I mean, it's not like, you know, you see the pictures on Instagram and it's like, hey, you know, but it's a lot to hold space for that Mm -hmm. many people. I do thrive in it and I and I love it. It's a profound experience and and I consider it a privilege that you and I have been paired and that this has been what has been revealed through our relationship. And so as we I was laughing, I was in my meditation office down in the garden where I sit every morning <laughs> in go, the middle of a sage bush. You disappear in the morning and go down the hill. <laughs> By the teepee and do some kind of, uh, I don't know, mystical hijinks down there. And then you come back and <laughs> reappear. <laughs> yeah, it's a, such a beautiful, beautiful time to connect. But I was giggling at myself because I'm reflecting on our relationship and our, our anniversary. And then I'm, I happen to know my death date from a Vedic chart that I had done mm. from one of the world-renowned <laughs> okay. uh, Chakrapanis. In the Vedic chart, there are very, very much information. I mean, specific things like children's birth and uh, the, the years that I built houses are in my uh, chart, the d- years I divorced. Like, it's all there. It's all there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I managed to get my death date. So, and it's in a ways, so I'm fine, but, um, all right, I'll be around, but, uh, I was laughing because, you know, if you're going to be on the planet, uh, some of your guests are talking about living to like 120 or I don't know, isn't there somebody, uh, you know, I don't really want to live that long. So, uh, I have, you know, another, you know, 27 years and I was cracking up thinking of what, what 27 years, like what, what is going to take up 27 years? And, you know, there's a whole evolution of a whole nother experience that's there. And it's like, we're at this exciting time on the planet when there's so much constriction and so much opportunity to create things that are beyond what we've ever known. And I know that is a divine privilege. And within the masculine feminine energies, which can be residing in any one, male or female, there is an opportunity to understand maybe a more expansive story about how those energies interact. And so bringing it back to uh, everything you have is within yourself. You, We all have everything that we need within our own beings. And as we embody more of our life form, uh, we are able to choose to dance with others in certain ways, but it comes from a place of complete sovereignty. So that's what I'm interested in exploring with you in this next phase. All right. I think that's a good place to end it for today. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Can I talk I wanna, a little bit about yeah, a couple of things that I'm yeah, doing? Yeah, no, I wanted to ask you about Water Tiger. Okay, first, thank you. First and foremost, and then there's something else I wanted to yeah. have you explore. So, well, that sort of that essence and, um, you know, about, I think when I came on the show in August, I was I was still, I was going through a rebirth and I, I had mixed feelings about even coming on your show. And then so many people reached out and they were happy that I was on. So at least the ones that I heard, I'm sure there were others that were, <laughs> you know, hating on me, but anyway. So, uh, but I went through a, a really sort of transformation when I was uh, sort of observing or reflecting on all these different traditions that I've studied with and different masters that I've been with and uh, just different uh, tools and techniques and perspectives. And what I've realized is from the whole group of everyone, that really comes down to your own perspective. And one of my most beloved, revered Indian saints is a woman named Ananda Moima. And her name actually is Sri Ananda Moima. And I love this also because my spiritual name is Ma Ananda Srimati. So we have every syllable the same except one. Mm. And uh, she was born realized and just really the energy of Divine Mother and such a magnificent energy. She never worked. Like she just existed in in radiating mm-hmm. high vibrational energy and people came to see her. She was a renunciant from the beginning, right? Uh, she was just, yeah, she was basically just born 
born awake. Uh -huh. And she did nothing but just radiate love and people created ashrams around her, but she was just in her divine state. But she said this one quote that is one of my favorite quotes, and that is, every man is right from his own point of view. And of course, that means woman too. Mm -hmm. But if you look at that, it's like everything is all about perspective. And so here I was, I have a birthday coming up on Sunday. I've been on the planet for many, many years. I'm going to be 57 on Sunday. And uh, what, I, what have I gained from 30 years of spiritual exploration and all these different rooms with different teachers and different traditions? And what I had realized with the, was that everyone has their own perspective. So if I know that everything is divine, and I know that you are divine, and I know that I am divine, and we all are divine, then I came into this body for a purpose. There is a, a purpose in here of why I'm alive Otherwise, I wouldn't be alive. So I turned my lens to really find this perspective. I'm really interested in this perspective that this life form has, rather than comparing to other traditions, or this is the way the Buddhists did it, or this is the way the you know, Vedic tradition does it. Or I'm more interested in, in me as a, as a life form of nature. And so this is where Water Tiger came from. So being able to merge into a natural form where there is no need for validation. You're not trying to convince another life form to be how you are. You're not writing books saying, you know, it's really great to be a tiger and everyone should be a tiger. You're simply in the exploration of your own heart. And so I launched an online spiritual mentorship group called Water Tiger, and it's been an extraordinary experience. I'm doing a monthly call, which is on a timely topic. Then I answer questions from everyone. There's a forum and you can go into the portal and put all of your questions. And then I offer a dedicated healing technique. And these are uh, an, a collection of minimal, very accessible and very powerful techniques that one can use to transform their life. And it will lead you into your own individual resonance. So I'm not really fostering interaction between the members because we have so much of that. Everything that we're listening to is out, outward focus. So this is all about inward, inward mm -hmm. focus. And it feels really, really good. Um, it's a very strong community already just after two months. And uh, it's been extraordinary. So that's really, really been amazing. Yeah, I think this is the culmination of your life's work in in motion and expression. And it's been really beautiful and cool to see you build this thing and and your own and cultivate your own community that you can speak with directly. Mm. And uh and and I think it's I think it's also um you know talking about continual evolution like it's a it's a it's a bizarre kind of quixotic thing that you became like the plant based chef and like known as you know this like vegan cook who wrote all these cookbooks because knowing you like that is a very small aspect of of who you are the larger the larger picture is is what you get to express through this new platform mm -hmm. and it's exciting that you know people can meet you Thank on you. that level and I think this you know if, if people are listening to this conversation or watching it and they're connecting with you I mean it's you know it's kind of obvious that this is what you are this is your purpose and this is what you're here to do it is thank you yeah I am uh I mean I'm a spiritual um way shower or guide or frequency a lot of people feel the energy of mother from me mm -hmm. and I have many, many, many people who come to me who have lost their mothers or uh, are feeling that support. And um, and so that's it. And it's in whatever I do, if it's my music or if it's in my food, I, I don't do it. I do it f to share the frequency of this spiritual connection. So hopefully it, it ignites a remembrance in those who are ready or those who want right. that. Whether it's food or some kind of, uh, offer, you know, mm -hmm. sort of verbal offering. These are just, mm -hmm. these are all divine offerings, right? It In is. different forms. It's all for that. And one of the things of the retreats, it's been so magnificent is that the people that come are largely people that 
follow you and that are coming to run with you or eat plant-based food. They're like, oh, and I'm going to check out Julie's yoga class. And what's been really profound to witness is the depth of experience that these people have had after working with me for the week and going through the spiritual transformation and the practices. And I want to just mention, I mean, these are not people who have practiced yoga their whole life or who are lifelong meditators. Uh, Some are, but uh, many of them are very, very new to the idea of spirituality, just sort of reawakening um, the idea that they are a divine person. And to see the uh, sort of uh, breadth of experience at such a deep, deep level, it was truly just the divinity of beginner's luck or, be, you know, the naivete of like a child. And I had to remind them, you know, people meditate their whole lives to have some of these experiences you yeah. guys had this week. And I think that's what that's what we are. I mean, at one point early on, before anybody was listening to us, we had printed a business card and you were the physical side and I was the spiritual side. And I think that it that that's what it is. It's like you provide a portal for those who are interested. So I want to encourage people to not create this mystique around spirituality like, oh, I don't understand it or it's only for a few. What I'm doing with Water Tiger is very, I mean, it's very deep. I don't I don't hold back. So you're gonna have your mind blown, but I am giving very visceral techniques, techniques that are like embodiment that put your awareness in your body, that bring your body organs online to communicate with each other, techniques that uh, sit you in front of the mirror and get you to look at yourself and really work out all that resistance and everything that you're hiding. So all the techniques are very, very um, accessible and and functional and and they work for a Mm -hmm. modern life. And what's going on with the cheese? Oh my gosh! So this is uh, can very you talk exciting. about that? Yeah, I can talk a about. Bit? It. Yeah, I can actually. Right. Um, so I am launching a commercial cheese line. I may have I may have mentioned it. Um, I was in talks with uh, some big corporate companies and uh, taking meetings with people, talking about how this company should be, and it started to feel very constrictive and very not in alignment for me. And so I kind of went away from everyone and went into my own experience. And I decided to create uh, cheese's art with all the devotion and the love and the taste and the beauty that I want in this product. And we should just point out for new listeners or or viewers, we're talking about plant-based cheese. That's right. It's plant-based cheese. So I published a book a few years ago called uh, This Cheese is Nuts. And I spent Um, two years creating a technology of creating plant-based cheeses. I'm extremely proud of this work. And the taste of the cheese is extraordinary. It's it, it fulfills and satisfies every need that you have for dairy cheese. And it's free from fillers and the weird gooey gums and like the whole wheat sort of weird vegan cheese, you know, category. Mm -hmm. Um, But like everything, I'm a designer, fashion designer, artist. So it has to be seeped in devotion and spirituality, and it has to be amazing design, and it has to be extraordinary taste. So since I published the book, I've had enough uh, public events where I've served the cheese for you know hundreds of people that are not plant-based, and I've seen it uh, proved. So I know the taste stands up, and I have people that have tasted my cheese two years ago that are still thinking about it. And I, I have a very uh, amazing um, talent to create these cheeses. So I have developed a brand, and the name is Shrimu. It is. You're actually yeah, I'm saying s- it out I'm loud. I'm actually saying it out loud. I wasn't sure whether yeah, yeah. you wanted to go public. No, I'm going that. to, and I'm going to give actually a link where people can uh, s- uh, sign up for subscription boxes, so they can. There's going to be a, just a landing page where they can go and just put their email in, and then when I launch, I will get to them. So this is going to be an offering. It's a collection of cheeses. And uh, because I'm a fashion designer, that if you want my cheese, you have to buy the collection. So it comes in a box of six flavors. A couple of those will probably be customizable, um, but it's an extraordinary collection. It has burrata, almond burrata that's called uh, Babe. It comes floating in a, it's in a jar floating in coconut milk. The next flavor is uh, called Cloud Nine, and it's nine balls of cashew mozzarella, and they're floating in crystal waters. I have another flavor called uh, Bonfire, and this is 
not your grandmother's cheese ball, but it's like a beautiful ball of smoked almond cheddar that has an outside layer of activated charcoal. Um, I have another flavor that's called Birdie, which is a camembert flavored cheese that is the star of every cheese board. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I have two other flavors. One is called uh, Spire, and this is a spirulina um, divine uh, aged cheese. And then the sixth one is called Elder, and this is an aged, uh, creamy, uh, just beautifully aged cheese with activated charcoal also layers in that. So this is all packaged in magnificent branding, uh, which I created with my friend Brian O'Hara, who did this This mandala and actually this coating on this water bottle. So Brian has uh, read and written backwards his entire life. And so I asked him to take the word devotional offering and create a hieroglyph or a pattern using that phrase. So for me, it's not cheese, it's a devotional offering. So it's called Shri, Shrimu. S-R-I-M-U. Yeah, do life, devotional offering of life, and it's not cheese. Right. Okay. Why Shrimu? Well, Shrimu, because it was kind of interesting because a lot of people I had worked with, um, uh, you know, the guys from the people from Headspace were like, you know, you should come up with a really catchy name. And they liked the name Not Cheese, which is a great name. That would be a great name. And I bought the URL for that. Um, and then there were some other names that were thrown out, uh, you know, by my previous partner that were all nice names. But I kept going back into my own divine design and the fact that. I was given the name Ma Nanda Srimati. I didn't ask for it. An Indian master gave me that name. And it means divine mother. I mean, it means more than that, but Srimati means divine mother. And within my chart, people want me to feed them. And within my Vedic chart, my birth is associated with the form of the cow. So the cow is divine to me. And when I went in to film the cover for This Cheese is Nuts, I called Gene Bauer and asked him if I could go to Farm Sanctuary, and I was invited in to work with the cows. I brought Jaya. And when we arrived, the handlers were in very serious, and they were like, Jaya can't come in the ring, and if this cow runs at you, run this way, and if this cow charges you, do this. And I said, well, can I put my arm around the cow? And they were like, wouldn't advise it. And I was thinking, wow, this is not what I had expected. And these cows are massive. Oh, they're huge, 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 huge cows, because we usually kill them before we see them in their full expression. So I just was like, okay, there were like one photographer who can come in, that's it. So I did a little quick breath work, just real fast, kind of created a field, walked in. And as I walked in, they all started lying down. And then the handlers started to relax. And then I said, can I put my arm around them? And they said, yes. So there I was lying with these cows, basically like dogs, kissing them. We got amazing photos. And when I was walking out, I said to the handlers, I said, thank you so much for inviting me for this experience. And one of the boys looked at me and he said, no, thank you for reminding us who these beings are. And I didn't quite understand it. But the next day, I received a letter from Lindsay, one of the managers at Farm Sanctuary. And she said, Julie, we have never seen the cows receive a first-time visitor the way they did you yesterday. And she said, you literally had them on their knees. So there is this proof. I always joke that they're like, dude, she's making nut cheese. Like, Like, help her out, out, chill her out, (laughs) you know, but... But it's like, you know, I don't know, then, you know, I didn't know that that I had that form associated with my birth. So I go back, I kept going back to the origin of who I am and the purpose of what I want to do. I want to create beautiful, artisanal, delicious cheese that give anyone who is looking for an alternative to cheese an option. And I want them to be made fresh. I want them to be, um, you know, something that is divine. And so they're offered in an offering box, almost in a sacred box. They have the word devotional offering on them. They're infused with my love of life, my love of this planet and of cows. And um, so that's where Srimu came from. Um, you know, I, I thought about Srimati, you know, it could have been Srimati like mother's cookies, you know, that also could have worked. But I really like Srimu. Brian liked the way that it worked graphically. And I feel that in the end, it's divine and it's a perfect name. Well, this is very exciting. And I've watched this evolve uh, from the sidelines. 
for quite some time. And the process of iterating on this idea has been, you know, an extended thing. It's not like you just woke up and like went running through this. Like you've really sat with how you want to express uh, your vision through these food products for a long time to, to arrive at a place that really feels um, true to who you are. And I think you've done that. So I'm excited for this to finally be publicly available soon. I didn't, I didn't know that you were going to actually <laughs> say publicly what the name is. And I know. Now I'm committed. You better get that landing page better get up. It done. No, yeah. I will. <laughs> yeah. So the, this is what when we it, thought. When, yeah. Like if we get okay, the landing page up, when is it going to be okay, publicly Okay. So the form is this, in order to keep it authentic to what I'm doing and to, you know, keep the production at the level that it has to be at. So what I'm doing is I am starting a subscription. I am considering doing an exclusive with one retailer. I won't say who the name is. Um, and it's a very reputable, you know, just like the ultimate uh, store that's in this space. Um, but my model is is subscription to begin. Yeah, direct to consumer. It's direct to consumer. So I'm looking for um, interest. I'm looking for orders that are basically shippable. So it would be, you know, in California and in the U.S. Unfortunately, I can't ship internationally right now. However, that is coming. I mean, that is in the business plan. So we're beginning, um, you know, there are future things that are down the line, like a flagship store. Um, and, you know, ultimately, one of my dreams would be to offer a f- sort of franchise that people could open cheese shops all over the world. And I could share this technology and this this ability with with people everywhere and give them a means to actually make a, a living. And, you know, Paul Hawking of Paul Hawkins, is Hawken. it Hawken of a uh, drawdown project. One of the things that he shares is that in order to shift the culture or, you know, shift consciousness, we need to give people a way to make a living. So that's kind of the long range view. But before I begin that, um, the product, you know, I'm going to be shipping out, you know, a couple hundred boxes of subscription cheese within the first three months. And then after that, I'll raise that to another, you know, another level. And at the same time, you know, we're in the workings of creating a flagship store and, and, you know, we're going to be getting information. And those of you who subscribe early on, you're going to be feeding, you know, we're going to be getting information from you. But um, I will say that I am very pleased with the review of the product well, the product is rock solid. I mean, the mm-hmm. cheese is insane. You know, Spire is my favorite. It's kind of like a blue cheese. Um, everything that you make is extraordinary and very different and better than any other plant-based cheese product that I've ever tasted. It's not even close. Like, and, and I think everyone who has experienced your mm-hmm. cheeses would agree. And of course, I'm biased, but, mm-hmm. um, but I think it is the truth. So mm-hmm. I'm excited for this. And if people want to uh, go to this Landing, this page. landing page. Where so, is this landing so page? So you should go to, it's just going to be <laughs> on my website, juliepyatt.com, uh-huh. and it'll probably be backslash Shrimu. But you could look in the tab and just look for Shrimu. It'll probably say Shrimu, not cheese. And then click on that and there'll be a form where you can enter your information if you want to be contacted when I launch. And so it's going to be on a yearly subscription. And I'm, I, you know, the, the initial idea is that there would be six boxes a year. So you're not getting, I mean, you know, again, we're talking about cheese. I mean, I would love for you to eat cheese every day, but not really, you know, it's like, I, I want you to eat healthy plants and, you know, we're not meant to be devouring boxes of cheese every day. I know that if you bring my box into your home once a month, you will be, your life will be elevated and you will uh, enjoy this amazing, um, Blessing, really. Can somebody just order it? Like, how, you're, you're expecting them to order for a year when they've never tried it, though. Can they just get a box and try it first? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, all right. Probably not. <laughs> probably no, not. No, probably okay. not. I mean, I probably would be that, you know, they, I don't know. I, I need to talk to my business partner about uh-huh. that because I don't, I don't want to say anything that's not. But no, the idea is it's been proven. I mean, the thing is, is between the people that have eaten my cheese at Plant Power Italia, if you guys have seen like the Insta stories and everything going on there, you know, we, we have a, a big body of individuals, I think, that are waiting for the cheese that are ready to yeah. order it. Um, you know, so maybe you don't want to be the first off. And if I do do an exclusive with this one retailer, then you could taste the cheese in that, in that area. The other idea is, though, that I would be doing 
pop-up events because um, I'm really I'm really interested in this community of drawing people together. So another thing that is part of the mission is that I would do a pop-up event where I would come and you could taste the cheese. So yeah, there'll be there will be an ability to taste the cheese unless you don't live in California and I and I'm not flying right, to your which state. Which is most people. But you know, um, I don't know. So uh, we'll have to see all how right. that all pans out. To be revealed. But in the meantime, um, JuliePyatt.com is the place to go. I'll put a link in the show notes and in the description beneath the YouTube version of this uh, when you have this specific URL so people can Beautiful. go there to do that. And if they want to explore the universe of Water Tiger, how do they do that? Going to juliepyatt.com and it's uh, there's a tab that says Water Tiger or it's backslash Water Tiger. And you'll scroll down. You'll see a very uh, interesting photo of me painted like a tree, pregnant seven months in the dark. Um, that is actually me. Uh, yes. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just keep scrolling down. <laughs> um, the other thing is, uh, I did want to mention that if anybody wants to listen to that song uh, that I spoke of, uh, that's associated with Lou's passing, you can um, find my album on my site under the music tab, and also on iTunes and Spotify. It's Srimati, and it's a mother of mine. It, the track is called "In the Sun." All right. And those links will also go up in the show notes and in the description. So, okay. all right. Rich Roll, I love you. Love you too. I'm so happy Thank we're going to be together for, now. <laughs> I guess we are. For a while. Are we? We think okay. we are. I, I mean, so. you know. All right. Yeah. Well, probably at least until uh, a moment arises to do another podcast. Okay. Well, that's good. That's the pact. That gives us some stability. All right. Cool. All right. You want to take us out? Peace. Plants. Namaste. That's what I'm talking about.